please join me in welcoming Dr. Jennifer Francis to Montclair State and to the Sustainability Seminar Series. Well, thank you, Mark, for that great introduction. You've told the whole story. We can all go home, and that's it. You know everything I'm going to say. <laughs> Seriously, um, thank you so much for coming. Um, and as Mark said, I'm going to be talking about this connection that we think is happening between the rapidly warming and melting Arctic. And we think there's a connection to extreme weather. So everybody loves weather, right? We talk about it all the time. Extreme weather is incredibly cool. But what I'm trying to talk about now, this research that connects these two things. So there's been a lot of extreme weather happening, not just in the United States, which you've heard about a lot lately, but around the Northern Hemisphere and the globe as a whole. I'm mostly going to focus on the Northern Hemisphere. The UK, England, has been dealing with an incredible string of stormy winters. In fact, they broke their precipitation record a couple of winters ago, which is saying something, because their records go back 250 years. There's a place in northern Japan where they're used to getting a fair bit of snow, but this, uh, this year in 2012, they broke their record. Now, I would love to see the snowplow that keeps that road clear. I just can't imagine it, but that would be pretty cool to see. We've seen unprecedented flooding happening in many regions. This happened, this example is in Louisiana a couple summers ago. Up in where I live, up near Boston, a couple winters ago, we broke our all-time snow record, which is saying something for Boston, because we get a lot of snow. You'll remember Hurricane Harvey last summer that dropped over 50 inches of rain. That's this much rain. I mean, that's a lot of snow when we get snow, right? But rain. Europe also has been having a lot of extreme events. This is from last summer, where they had a lot of heat waves and forest fires, mostly in the Mediterranean part of, of Europe. And you notice the northern part, the UK and Scandinavia, they actually had a summer without a summer. And as Mark mentioned, California has been dealing with a multi-year drought still going on. Last winter, we'll all remember the parade of nor nor'easters that came up the coast. This is what it looked like where I live about five times last winter. And just a couple weeks ago, we were talking about nothing but Hurricane Florence hitting the Carolinas. So scientists like me are not the only ones paying attention to all this extreme weather. A lot of companies care a lot too, especially insurance companies. So this information is actually from a reinsurance company. That means a company that insures insurance companies. And what this is showing is how many extreme events have happened going back to 1980 every year. So each of these colors represents a different kind of extreme event. The red ones are what we call geophysical events, so things like earthquakes and tsunamis and uh, volcanoes, things like that. The green, the blue, and the orange are all related to weather somehow. So what you notice is that the red ones are not increasing, but all the ones related to weather are. So all of those examples I just showed you, those pictures of various extreme conditions, all have something in common. Anybody want to take a guess what that is? Sure. Hurricanes? No. That's snow in Japan and snow in Boston. All right. So when I talk about extreme weather events, I'm not talking about hurricanes per se or tornadoes. But what I'm talking about are extreme events that are caused by weather patterns that get stuck. All right, so think about that California drought, for example. If it's dry for a couple of weeks, eh, no big deal. But if it goes on for months or even years, then we've got a problem. We have a big drought, All right? So if we have a very stormy weather pattern along the East Coast here, we expect to get a nor'easter or two every winter, right? But when you get six in a row, practically, that becomes an extreme event, all right? So that's what I'm talking about when I'm 
going to talk about this potential connection to the Arctic. All right, so keep that in mind. All right, so let's just kind of set the stage a little bit. I'm sure you've all seen a graph like this. This is how the Earth's temperature has behaved over the last thousand years or so, going back to year 1000 up to almost present here. And what you see is that the blue line there, which is based on not thermometers, but what we call proxy information, so things like tree rings and ice cores, what you notice is up until very recently, the Earth was actually getting cooler. We were in a cooling trend. And the red line there is when thermometers started. And what we see is a very dramatic increase in the Earth's temperature. And this doesn't even go to present. So actually, if we bring that up to where we are now, we're almost a degree warmer than we should be. This is not normal. And if we look at just the warmest 10 years that we have have during our human experience, what we notice is that they've all occurred since 2005, except one. So this is a very strong signal of what we call global warming. And I'm sure you've all heard a lot about that. But what you might not have heard about is that in addition to the temperature going up, the Earth's water vapor content, the atmosphere water vapor content, is also increasing. So this is going back to the 1970s, and we see an increase in the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere of about 7%. Now this is expected as the air gets warmer and the oceans get warmer and they evaporate more moisture into the air. But this is a very big deal that doesn't get enough press. And the reason is because that water vapor is the fuel for storms. We know that about hurricanes. I'm sure you've all heard that. But it's all storms really rely on that water vapor in the atmosphere. Because when it condenses into clouds, it releases a lot of heat into the atmosphere. And that heat is energy. Water vapor is also the most important greenhouse gas. Bet you didn't know that. You all thought it was carbon dioxide. Um, water vapor is the biggest, most important greenhouse gas. So it's adding to the effect of carbon dioxide that we're putting into the atmosphere. And all that extra moisture in the air is also causing heavy precipitation events to occur more often. So here we have a chart of the United States, and those percentages are telling us how, much, how many more heavy precipitation events have occurred since 1950, which is basically when greenhouse gases really started to increase. So look at us here in the Northeast there. That's, we're seeing the biggest increase in heavy precipitation events. What, what defines a heavy precipitation event? It's like the top five percentile or something like that. It's a percentile. Okay. I don't remember exactly what it is, but it's a percentile. Oh, so it's relative to what normal would be for each location. OK, so now we're going to go up to the far north. This is my love. This is where I've been studying my whole career. Up in the upper right there is showing you the Arctic Ocean, remember the Arctic is mainly an ocean surrounded by land, and what the sea ice, this is the ice floating on the ocean, what it used to look like back in the 1970s and up until about the mid-1980s. So this is what it would look like during the summertime after it had melted back to its smallest extent, which it does every summer. So down here is what it looks like now. And we just reached the minimum for this past year. Now, all this red area you see here is where the ice has been lost. Half of the sea ice has disappeared in 40 years. This is a huge change in the climate system. And it's happened really fast. One of the reasons it's so important is because that ice is very white, right? So when sun hits it, it reflects most of that energy right back to outer space. It never warms anything on the Earth. But now that we've lost so much of that ice, much more of the sun's energy is going into the ocean and warming it up. And in fact, the loss of sea ice and the loss of snow in the spring on land has made global warming 25% worse than it would have been if we didn't have snow and ice being lost in the system. It's a very big deal for a lot of reasons. And we're going to talk about more of those. 
So here we have an animation looking down again on the North Pole. And what's being shown here is now not how big the ice is in extent, but how thick the ice is and how it's been changing since the late 1970s. And what you notice is that date gets closer and closer to 2017 there is those bright yellows and oranges are basically gone now. Those are the thickest ice categories. So what we're left with, this ice that's left in the Arctic is much, much thinner than it used to be. So if you take that change in thickness and you multiply it by the change in extent, you get a volume, right? If we look at how the volume of the sea ice has changed, we've lost three quarters of the ice in the Arctic in only 40 years. It's huge. So one of the ramifications of losing all that ice is the way that the Earth has been warming. It's not even all around the planet. So again, we're looking down on the North Pole here. All those red colors in the middle are right over the Arctic Ocean. And these are the trends in the temperature during the winter time. And so you see that those warming, the warming is biggest over the Arctic Ocean, in part because of losing all that ice. But you also see a lot of other interesting features here, right? Over the United States, the eastern United States, those blue colors say that it has been cooling in the eastern part of the United States. And over in Eurasia, it's been cooling in the winter. What's up with that? We're going to talk about that. And another way we can look at that is to see how the Arctic's temperature has been changing over time. So this is going back to the late 1940s. The blue line is how the Arctic's temperature has been changing. The red line is how the temperate region or the mid-latitudes has been changing. That's the, the area where we all live. And what you notice is really it hasn't been changing very much here, but the Arctic has been warming very, very fast. In fact, it hit an all-time record in terms of the difference between these two in 2016. This is what Mark called Arctic amplification. It's the extra warming that's happening up in the Arctic. So that difference, you can see, was huge in 2016, much bigger than it ever had been before. But it's generally getting larger over time, and all of the climate models project it to continue to get warmer and warmer in the Arctic relative to mid-latitudes. So this is what we call Arctic amplification. So why do we care that the Arctic is warming so fast? Well, one of the reasons I'm going to try to describe here, which is going to link in with this idea of more persistent weather patterns. Okay, We're going to try to loop back to what I talked about in the very beginning. So think about a layer of atmosphere, a layer of air, extending from here in New Jersey all the way up to the Arctic. All right. Now, we know that when air is warmer, it takes up more room than when it's cold. So warm air expands, right? Basic physics. So that means the thickness of this layer in New Jersey is much thicker here than it is up in the Arctic. So if you were sitting on top of this layer and looking north, you'd be looking down a hill, right? Well. So if you have some air sitting on top of this layer, it wants to flow down that hill just like water wants to flow down a mountain. All right? So we've got this hill, and this air wants to flow down the hill. That creates a wind. Now, because the Earth is spinning, that wind gets turned to the right. Everything that moves in the northern hemisphere gets turned to the right. It's called the Coriolis force. So, that wind turning to the right becomes this river of wind high up in the atmosphere that we call the jet stream. Now, think back to Arctic amplification. What's happening to this layer? It's getting thicker in the Arctic faster than it is here because the warming's happening more there than it is here. So that hill is getting less steep, right? So there's less force to drive that wind in the jet stream. 
So here's a little arrow that sort of looks something like what the jet stream looks like. And we know that when that jet stream wind gets weaker, it's more easily deflected from its west to east path by things like mountain ranges, by sea surface temperature changes, things like that. So we tend to see a jet stream that travels north and south more when the jet stream is weak. This is the hypothesis. So we think there are two effects of this rapidly warming Arctic. One of them we just talked about, these weaker westerly winds, and the other is an intensification of these big northward swings in the jet stream that we call ridges. All right, we're going to talk about those in a couple of minutes. But both of them have the same basic result. And here we have two particular days, one a day in November in 2013, and when the Arctic was very cold, those red arrows are showing you what the jet stream basically looked like that day. And you can see that when the Arctic was really cold, that jet stream pretty much just went straight around the North Pole. But on the right here is a day in January 20, 2014. This is a very special day. It's the day that the polar vortex attacked us. Do you remember that in the news? This was the day it happened. So it just so happened that the Arctic was very warm. You see how those blue colors have kind of moved southward. And instead, we have that white color there. That's suggesting that the Arctic is very warm. And we see that the jet stream is now in a very wavy pattern. All right? So this is the idea. We've got this rapidly warming Arctic. These two effects are having basically the same result, making the jet stream take these bigger north-south swings. The basic idea is that when these waves in the jet stream are small in the north-south direction, like on the upper simulation here, they tend to move quickly from, from west to east, OK? But when they get big, like the lower panel here, they tend to move much more slowly from west to east, all right? This is basic meteorology, actually. So this is not uh, a surprise. But why would we care about those waves? Why am I making a big deal about these waves in the jet stream? The reason is because those waves control our weather. All right? So here's a schematic of a typical jet stream over the North America. All right? You can see the blue arrow there is the jet stream, this river of fast moving air high over our heads. And first of all, you notice that it separates the cold air to the north from the warm air to the south. So if the jet stream is north of you, you tend to be in warmer than normal air, and vice versa if it's south of you. So that's the first thing. But as I said, these waves, these north-south swings, are what really create our weather. So in this part of the wave, where the winds are coming from the northwest, that's when we tend to get high pressure, beautiful blue skies, dry conditions, all right? Nice weather. You want to be in that part, if, unless you're in a drought. But over on this side of the wave, when the winds are coming from the southwest, that's where we get the dynamics in the atmosphere that create storms, all right? This is also called the storm track. When we have the jet stream over our heads like this, this is when we tend to get nor'easters and storms, all right? So the dynamics of these waves in the jet stream are what create our weather patterns. And it's too bad it's not that simple. So here's a real jet stream. Here's what the real winds of the atmosphere look like. These, this is an animation that was made by NASA's Science Visualization Studio of real winds in the atmosphere. The blue and, or sorry, the red and yellow colors there are where the winds are really strong. So you can see pretty clearly where the jet stream is, but it's not simple. It's awful. I mean, especially if you're trying to do research and figure out how the jet stream's changing, it's chaos. But what you notice is that there are times when the waves are small and see them moving fast across the continent, and then there are times when they're big and they basically stay in one place. So when those waves stay in one place, depending on where you are relative to one of those waves, you tend to have the same kind of weather for a long time. All right? So we're starting to connect the dots here. So the question is, how can we measure 
whether the jet stream is actually getting wavier or not. Well, that's what I've been working on. And it's, now that you've seen what the real world looks like, I can tell you it's not simple. So I'm just going to explain a couple of the simple ways we've been trying to go about this. So one of the first things we're doing is we're looking at that layer of atmosphere that I was talking about like you would a topographic map if you were going hiking, all right? So you know that when those values on the topographic map are high, that's where the land is high. That's where you'd find mountains. And when they're low, that's where you find valleys. So on a topographic map of this layer of atmosphere is where we find warm air in the red and cold air in the blue. And when those lines are really close together, those of you who are hikers will know that means that's where the land is really steep, right? The side of a mountain. Well, the same thing is true with this topographic map. And where that hill is really steep, what are we going to find there? That's where the jet stream's located. So we can use this idea to measure these waves in the atmosphere. All right, so let's zoom in on North America here. Same kind of map, all right? There's North America. Here we are in New Jersey right here. All right, here's California, here's Alaska up here. So, same, same map. So what we do is we take one of these lines that tends to be located in that tight, where those lines are really close together, because we want to measure the jet stream, right? So we pick one like that. And we measure every single day how far north it goes and how far south it goes. And we measure the difference in latitude between those two. And when that difference is really big, we call it a really wavy day, all right? This is a simple way to take a mess and make some sense of it. So what do we get when we look at how the number of these very wavy days changes over time? So that's what this green line is, going back to the late 1970s to almost present. The green line is saying that the frequency of these very wavy days all around the northern hemisphere is going up, right? That's kind of what we thought would happen. And the black dashed line there is the west to east wind speed of the jet stream. And what do you see that doing? It's going down, all right? So weaker winds, bigger waves. And that's what we thought we'd see. If we zoom in on just uh, the North Atlantic here, which is really more relevant for our weather, we see that they're increasing even faster, okay? So this is just one simple way that we've started to try to think about how to go about measuring what's going on with the jet stream. So remember there were, there were two things that I said Arctic amplification did. One was the weaker winds and the other was these more intense ridges, okay? Let's talk about that. And this is a hypothesis that we just published last year, and we called it, It Takes Two to Tango. Partly to get news bites, but also because you'll see why. So the idea is, here we have North America, here's the Pacific Ocean, here's the Arctic up here, filled with lots of ice back in the good old days, right? So a wave in the jet stream comes along, one of these big ridges, right? It doesn't have any, the Arctic isn't doing anything because it's really not changing from one year to the next yet. So fast forward to what it looks like these days. We have this big chunk of ice missing here north of Alaska. This is one of the places where ice is disappearing the fastest. During the summer, a lot of extra heat from the sun is absorbed into that ocean where the ice used to be. And then in the fall, when the cold air comes back, all of that heat is released back to the atmosphere and warms it up, makes it thicker, right? So what happens when a ridge in the jet stream comes along? Well, if it's located here, there's really no connection there. They're not co-located, so there's really no effect. But if the ridge happens to be located here, then all that extra heat that is coming out of the ocean back into the atmosphere, making that layer thicker, is gonna make that ridge stronger and more intense. It's making the wave bigger. And we know what happens when waves get bigger, right? They move more slowly from west to east, all right? So that it takes two to tango part 
is that A, you need to lose ice in a certain location, and B, you need to have your ridge lining up in the right place. Well, what makes a ridge sit here versus over there? Well, there are a lot of things that control where ridges tend to be. One of them happens to be um, how the Pacific Ocean's temperature pattern sets up. And when there's a lot of warm water along the west coast of North America, we tend to find a ridge right there. So let's think back to what's been happening over the last several years. We've got this big drought that's been happening in the western part of our country, right? So it just so happens the water has been very warm off the west coast. It's a fluctuation in temperature similar to El Nino, but a longer duration one. It's called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. And when we get that warm water sitting out here, we tend to have a ridge sit there too. And we've also been losing a lot of ice up here. So my idea is that these two factors together have been responsible for most of the California's drought. You'll notice over here in the east, we're in the trough. We're in the dip in the jet stream, right? What happens there? All the cold air comes down from the Arctic. This is why I think we've been having these long cold spells in our winter. And remember back to those temperature trends over the winter where the eastern part of North America had cooling, whereas the rest of the world almost, except for Eurasia, which I'm going to talk about in a second, has warming? I think this is why. OK, so for, I'm going to jump into the weeds a little bit here for those of you who are kind of weather weenies and want a little more data. So hang in there if, you're, if this is a little complicated. But this is an example of it takes two to tango happening over Eurasia and I think helping to explain those cooling temperatures that are happening over there, OK? So here we have the timeline from September, basically when ice is at its minimum, the Arctic ice, going through the winter right through to February, all right? This blue squiggly line here is the jet stream, OK? So there tends to be a climatological ridge. A ridge tends to exist right about there, OK? And it's because of the Ural Mountains. There's a mountain range right there. So there tends to be a ridge in that location. And just north of that is another area where the sea ice has been disappearing faster than almost anywhere else. It's called the Barents Kara Sea. So what's been happening? This ridge has been ex extended, intensified by that warming caused by the loss of ice in that area. So we're getting this bulge in the ridge. This is causing a surface high to form that brings cold air down from the Arctic and bringing snow with it. And so over Siberia, they've been having much colder, snowier early winters because of this. And this is when it gets a little hairy, all right? This purple thing up here is up in the very high levels of the atmosphere called the stratosphere. It's the true polar vortex. People have been calling the jet stream the polar vortex. It's not. You can correct them. It's actually up much higher in the atmosphere in the stratosphere. So in the wintertime, when the jet stream gets very wavy, when it gets these big ridges and troughs, it sends wave energy up to the stratosphere. And what does that do? It basically makes it get all wavy too, like this picture over here. And those two things exchange wave energy through the winter. And it perpetuates this very wavy pattern in the jet stream, making it very cold over Eurasia. This happened in spades last winter. The, jet, the polar vortex in the stratosphere was so disturbed that it actually split into two. And that's partly why we had such an extended snowy winter along the East Coast because the jet stream was very disrupted, too. OK, that's a lot of stuff. But I know some of you kind of feed off of this kind of information. So just wanted to mention that there's many, many, many recent papers that have all found this mechanism. So this is not, we're not talking about you know, out there. This is pretty solid stuff. All right, so let's think back to what happened last year, all right? 
You remember we had a very cold spell from early January to mid-February. They had snow in Florida. There were frozen iguanas falling out of palm trees. It was very cold for an extended period. Can you imagine in your minds what the jet stream must have looked like? Right? Big ridge over the west. It was very warm and dry out there. Big dip or trough in the east. All that cold air came down. This pattern was very, very persistent because the wave was very large. Okay? But then in February, things changed a bit. And we had several weeks where in the east, you might remember, going to the beach in February, we had record-breaking heat all along the East Coast. Those circles there are all broken records for warmth while it was cold out West. So what did that jet stream pattern look like? Yes, we had the big dip instead out West with a big ridge in the East, okay? So now whenever you see a map of the jet stream on the TV weather channels or whatever, you'll be able to go, oh yeah, I know what that weather's gonna look like. All right, so we're gonna connect this back. I'm almost done, got a couple more slides to the Arctic. So this is showing how the Arctic last winter behaved starting in November, in November of 2017, and this is winter of 2018. And what we're looking at here is going up in the atmosphere. Remember, think back to that polar vortex up in the stratosphere. This is the stratosphere up here, going through time. And all these red blobs here are when the Arctic was way warmer than normal. So two things. First of all, you can see that it was warmer than normal most of the time, but also that it's not a constant thing. It's sort of episodic. You get these pulses of, of warmth up there. So what we see when we put all of the extreme events that happened in the United States, well, this is all around the Northern Hemisphere, actually, and how they line up with these blobs of warmth in the Arctic is pretty interesting. So every time we had one of these really big blobs, we can find an extreme event that happened at the same time. So we had record cold in the Northeast in early December. We had uh, a big nor'easter in January. Remember the bomb cyclone that was in the newspapers? And here's our nor'easters that came during this big warm period out in the Arctic. So this is one of the ways we're starting to try to connect what's going on in the Arctic with these kinds of extreme events that are happening down here. Finally, this is brand new work that actually just came out this week where we're now trying to figure out ways to measure whether in fact our weather patterns are becoming more persistent or not. So we can see the wave, the frequency of these big wavy patterns changing, but is our weather really becoming more persistent? So one of the ways we've been doing this is to look at how many days in a row it's dry in a location, or how many days in a row is it wet in a location? And then we count up all of, the, all of the times when it's longer, it's either dry or wet for more than four days in a row, okay? And we've done this at 17 locations across the United States. So this is using actual measurements of rain. And what you see is these little colored boxes here are saying that if it's pink on this side, there are more dry spells now in the last couple of decades than there were historically, and the green ones here on the right are when there were more wet spells happening, so these long duration dry spells and wet spells. And what we tend to see is this area from the southeast up to the northwest where there are more of these dry spells happening, so a tendency for persistent dry spells to occur more often, and the green areas there tend to be a little bit shifted north but also an indication that we're seeing a more, more persistent wet spells as well. So that's just some, just trying to give you a taste for some of the research that we're doing these days. So here's a look into the future. This is a prediction for this coming fall. And if you think back to what we just saw, it actually makes a little sense. So here we're expecting to have, I know you guys had a really wet spring, summer, but it looks like it's gonna keep going in the, in the mid-Atlantic this fall. 
and more hot, dry conditions out west. We have a lot of hot water sitting in the ocean off here. We lost a lot of ice north of Alaska this year. So this, I think, could be related to that it takes two to tango idea, um, creating this continuation of this pattern. And what does the future hold, the distant future? Well, here's what climate models are telling us what's going to happen with the summer sea ice extent, so how big the sea ice is going forward. So this black line here is what it's actually done over time. As I said, it's been decreasing rapidly. And the models are, all, are doing a pretty good job of simulating what the real world actually did in terms of how much sea ice there is. But going forward in time is when it gets interesting. So we have these different scenarios, and they depend on us. What are we going to do? Are we going to be able to limit our emissions of carbon dioxide? And if we don't, the red line is the most likely scenario. So what this is saying is that somewhere around the middle of this century, which sounds like a long way away, but it's really not, like 25 years away, we're probably going to lose all of the ice in the summer. It's all going to go away. That's almost a certainty, I'd say. But if we can get our acts together and stop emitting so much carbon into the atmosphere, we can actually save some of the ice up in the Arctic. But as I'm sure you know, this is going to take a lot of effort. So here's the good news. I told you I'd leave you with some good news, right? Do you recognize that? I think that's along the coast of New Jersey here somewhere, right after Sandy. I promise this is good news. All right, there's a lot we can do. There's a lot we can do, all right? We can all do something. And it really adds up to everybody doing a lot of things. No one thing is going to solve this problem. But we can all do as much as we can. So some of the ideas are really related to everything you do all day long, in your life, think about how you can be more efficient, how you can use fewer greenhouse gases in some way through conservation, turning off the lights, turning off everything you can turn off, be more efficient, course renewables. So for example, if you're done with something, you're done with your computer, you're done with even using your hot water, just turn it off. It's some simple stuff like that. Don't leave your car running while you run into Starbucks. Turn it off. It's really not that hard. Because probably you're going to run into two friends in there, and you end up talking for half an hour while your car's sitting out there spewing fossil uh, greenhouse gases. Try to use your car less. Consolidate errands. Ride your bike and walk more. I mean, these are all things that you know, right? But you just got to keep them in the front of your brain. And we all have to be doing it. And the most important thing we can do is vote. And vote for people who get it. Right? And it's hard because even people who get it don't want to do it because they probably won't get reelected. But if we all get it in our heads that, hey, you know, this is so important that, you know, you got to get over, you got to get over it. We got to get this done. So that's really the most important thing we can each do. Thank you, thank you again for coming. Happy to answer some questions if you've got them. Questions? Yes. Um, Mark mentioned you do a lot of media and videos. So this is obviously terrifying and not great. And we all get this because we're scientifically minded. But how do you explain this to maybe my dad, who watches a certain news channel no one should ever watch? He <laughs> has a bit of a hard time coming to terms. So I think one of the reasons I've had some success in talking to people who normally don't want to listen is because I can start with extreme weather. And people want to know about extreme weather. You know, What's going on with Hurricane Florence? Why is it behaving so weirdly? Why did Sandy behave so weirdly? Why is this drought going on so long? Why are the farmers not able to plant corn in certain areas anymore? I mean, you can start with things that people, it's affecting people's lives 
directly, especially their wallets. And then if you can weave in a little information about you know, why Hurricane Florence dumped so much rain, well, A, there's a lot more water vapor in the atmosphere now, right? That's undisputed. Um, but B, we also think that these storms are going to start behaving weirdly more often because they're going to run into these areas where, in Florence's case, the jet stream was just nowhere near. And so there was no wind to, to steer it. So I call this slipping spinach into a cheeseburger. So if you can entice them with the cheeseburger and then slip a little spinach in there, you know, just a little. It doesn't have to be the whole thing. Um, sometimes people start listening. You know, there are some people who are so hard over they just don't want to hear anything and I, you know, I just don't bother with them. But there's a big bunch in the middle who are curious and they notice that things are weird and things are different and they want to know what's going on. Thanks for that good question. Yes. Hi, my name is Brandon and I'm a student of Dr. Chopin. Um, my question for you is, uh, if eventually our society gets to a point where there's no turning back and we've done too much damage to our atmosphere and things like that, what are some things that would happen? I don't think that's an if. Um, we're not going back. I mean, we've changed things so much that it's really now a matter of making it as less bad as we can. Um, so what is bad? So, you know, it depends on where you live. Um, of course, along the coast here, we're dealing with sea level rising. Um, it's rising faster along the New Jersey coast than just about anywhere on the planet. And it's going to cost a lot of money. Um, to deal with that, but we don't have a choice. You know, we can sit around and wait for a storm to happen and, and destroy a whole bunch of infrastructure, or we can get ahead of it and try to, you know, either move in infrastructure or build it stronger or raise it up or whatever. In the little town where I live, um, we just realized that all of the pumps that take sewage from various parts of town and pump it to the sewage treatment plant are all in the velocity zone, which means that when we get a storm, it's just going to wipe them out. So just realizing stuff like that, and that's something we can get ahead of and, and either build them up or move them or do stuff like that. Um, I think knowing what the threats are in your particular area, whether it's um, heavier precipitation events, so having to plan for um, you know, really heavy rain and then maybe a period with no rain. So, you know, building better reservoirs and planning ahead better for, you know, how your fresh water is going to get stored and distributed and things like that. Um, you know, there's, there's no one answer to that question. It really kind of depends. But that's why I think this research is really important because we need to have a better handle on what our expectations are for different places, different seasons, in different conditions. Jennifer, Noah just issued a tornado watch for this area. So. Cool! Let's get out there. <laughs> really? Yeah. Wow. Where do we go? <laughs> it's a watch, right? So we're okay for a minute or two. Yes, Greg. Uh, this morning, I came across this map. It was, it was a map of the frequency of, of flashy precipitation across the United States. Flashy? Like, like, how like it, it, can, it goes along the Flash floods, you mean? No, but your, your 5% precipitation events okay. would be abnormal. Yeah, yeah. And, and as expected, they're more frequent in the western United States and along the Gulf Coast. And it surprised me that there's this little area of northern New Jersey and Hudson Valley in New England that was more flashy than anywhere else on the, in the eastern United States. So the, the frequency of, of kind of like severe rain events was higher than anywhere else. That surprised me. It was based on the last 30 year record. So it wasn't a more recent thing. It was supposedly based on a climatic record. But so, so that, I wonder why that is for here, but you're talking about how um, there might be, there should be an increase in these kind of like major events. Uh, 
that so theoretically that should be actually getting worse for us. It's you know what on this map it was like tends to be more than normal. What we were here was not nearly what it was in like Arizona, like what they're getting today with the hurricane. Yeah. But still, it was higher than the rest of the earth. So, would, is that kind of weather event going to become more common in our area, in northeast? Well, yeah, and I think that's what that graphic that I showed you of the country, the fact that the northeast was one of the areas where these heavy downpours are happening more often. I mean, this is measurements. This is not a model. This is actually already happening. So um, I don't know why northern New Jersey particularly would stand out that way, but um, I haven't seen that exact um, map that you're talking about. But it seems to basically fit with yeah. what I showed. Yeah. And it is, it is you know, just basically because we've, we've got more water vapor in the atmosphere now. So when any storm comes along, it's not going to be the same storm it used to be. It's going to have a lot more fuel to work with, and it's going to have a lot more moisture to work with. I thought it was interesting out, out west, California, they have a big seasonality precipitation, whereas in our area, it is pretty much across the board. We have like, the same precipitation across every month, mm -hmm. yet it was still uh, episodes of, of mm -hmm. and severe precipitation, yeah. more so than not. Yeah. Well, I can't say much more without having seen it, but yeah, seems to fit. Yes? So um, if everyone of us decides to take the um, precautionary measures, and how fast would it, um, these changes are very drastic, right? How fast would we reverse the changes? How fast do you think? So we're not going to reverse anything we are going to be able to slow them down. And I think everybody's got to kind of get their heads around that. Um, you guys are going to be dealing with it. Um, so, yes. So not only do we have to do whatever we can to slow it down as much as possible, but we also have to realize that there's a lot of change coming our way. There's no way around that. And so we're going to have to, like the other question, we're going to have to understand what those changes mean for our community here or you know other places in the in the country or the world and start thinking about how we can adapt as you say and prevent um, harm any way we can change plot you know plant different crops for example um, prepare for more of these extreme precipitation events but also prepare for long stretches with no precip precipitation. So, you know, there's, it's different in different places, but it's, it's both things. You know, do whatever we can to make it less bad and get ready for what's coming. Yes? For, for the predictions you showed for the fall 2018, in terms of the extreme events, is that based on a relationship you feel to the historical data or? Um, which for, which for projection it, for extreme events? Yeah, you showed a map for four to this fall. Oh yeah yeah yeah. What's that? Um, that those tend to be based on um, similar situations leading up to the fall, so they're analogs basically, or a combination of analogs based on say sea surface temperature patterns and rainfall patterns that we've had during the summer. And those are good predictors of what the future holds. But there are also seasonal predict prediction models being used more and more that are also based primarily on sea surface temperature anomaly patterns and things like that, soil moisture. So it's a combination. Yes. Um, thank you for your talk. It was very, very accessible. I actually understood most of it. It's a nice change of pace. I'm a social scientist. Cool. Glad um, to hear it. I had a question about the southern hemisphere. Yeah. Um, because you hear about extreme drought in Australia, right. East Africa. Uh, is there a similar phenomenon of work here? Is there a southern jet stream, and does it interact with the Antarctic in a similar way? There is a southern jet stream. Antarctica is a completely different beast. So. Antarctica is a continent 
covered in a huge thick layer of ice, whereas the Arctic is an ocean surrounded by land. So completely different climate systems. And there is sea ice in the Southern Ocean as well. But every summer, it pretty much melts all the way back to the coast of Antarctica. And so you don't have this opportunity to absorb extra heat into the ocean because it's already melting all the way back to the land and it can't go any farther. So you don't have an Antarctic amplification going on. So we're not seeing the same kinds of effects on that jet stream down there. That said, there are other things going on that are affecting the jet stream down there, leading to some of those extremes that you mentioned. So one of the things is that the tropics are expanding towards the poles. And so it's moving the jet stream basically farther south in the southern hemisphere. And so that means that the storms associated with the jet stream aren't making it to Australia so often. And they're not making it up to parts of Argentina and Chile like they used to, because it's all farther south. So that's one of the things. Um, there's a lot I could talk about. But um, another one is that the ozone hole is playing a role as well. So ozone is a greenhouse gas. Maybe you didn't know that. And of course, it also has this effect on the, the ultraviolet radiation. It absorbs ultraviolet radiation from the sun when it comes down. And that's why we all don't get burned to a crisp. So, but that, that loss of ozone in the upper levels of the southern atmosphere have different effects in different seasons. So because there's less ozone now in the spring, it's, it's uh, not blocking as much of the UV radiation. So it's actually cooler up there than it used to be because it's not absorbing. There's not enough ozone there to absorb as much UV. So we're getting a cooling signal in the spring. But then in the other seasons, it's putting on its greenhouse gas hat. And we're not getting as much warming there in the other seasons and upper levels. So it's a very complicated. Um, interaction with their polar vortex, because that's where the ozone is up there. So it's still a very um, heavily researched topic. So, but all very different from the Arctic story. Yes? Great question. Um, back to Sandy real quick. What happened with it that it was, that it came back around to New Jersey? Was that, was that because of the jet stream? Oh, that reminds me. So this is today's jet stream. This is what's over your head at this moment, all right? The reason that triggered my memory was because, OK, there's North America right there. You can see that. Up north of Alaska, do you see that big swirl up there in the polar jet stream? So here we've got this wind going up and around like this, OK? When we get one of these eddies forming in the jet stream, this is an eddy, just like in a river, when it's like this swirl that breaks off from the main flow. We call that a block. When Sandy came along up the coast, up the east coast here, there was a block just like that sitting right here. And the winds around that block, as Sandy came up the coast, the winds were blowing from the east and it sent it right into New Jersey. Right, because I remember them predicting or thinking, oh, you know, it's going to head out towards the ocean. No worries. But right. Just, like, came back right. Real quick. So these blocks are another form of a very wavy jet stream. Sometimes it gets so wavy that it breaks off one of these eddies. And we're seeing an increase in these blocking patterns, especially in the summer. So this is one of the reasons why we think hurricanes like Sandy, you know, weirdness, basically, is going to happen more often because we're going to see more of these features like this. And this one right now is bringing a whole bunch of warm air right up to the North Pole. This very high latitude for a block like this. So it's a pretty unusual pattern to see in the jet stream. Yeah. Is a block um, like a? Uh result of like global warming? It's not a result. There have always been blocks. But we think they're going to happen, and they have been happening more often, because of the Arctic getting so warm and favoring this wavy pattern in the jet stream happening more often, too. 
And we do now have some evidence that that's happening. So it's not that the block is caused by the Arctic warming so fast, but we think that they're going to be favored. They're going to happen more often because of it. So it's a probability thing. Not, you can't pin on any single event like this and say, oh yeah, that was the Arctic did that. Can't do that. OK. I think Dr. Francis is going to be able to stay for a few minutes after, but I think some of you actually have to leave for other classes and things like that. Um, so please join me in thanking our speaker. And feel free to stay um, after for a little while if you have extra questions. Thank you.